Director of Institute of Archaeology and Ethnology Polish Academy of Science, with Dr. Dagmara Vera, Dr. Iwona Sobkowiak-Tabaka, and Katarzyna kerneder gubała proudly presents lecture from conference Flint in Time and Space, Time and Space in Flint. Thank you very much. Uh, I met uh, a number of you in Barcelona a few years ago, and I'm happy to see you again. I just want to uh, thank the organizers real quick here. A little bit of backstory about this research. This is a preliminary pilot study analyzing chocolate flint. Um, but uh, I met Dak Mara in Barcelona two years ago, and uh, resulting conversations from that conference uh, led to a collaboration. So around Christmas time this year, I got the best Christmas present ever from Santa Claus. He showed up in my office. It was a box of uh, famous chocolate fl flint from Poland. And of course, uh, you know, growing up in the United States and in, in archaeology, I had read much about it or heard of the, the famous chocolate flint. So to receive that was a real treat for me. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but uh, today, I'd like to just present our preliminary results on that, uh, that analysis. Uh, first, uh, to begin, I think it's important to just um, talk about the framework of this type of study. I'm always very excited to present uh, to this type of audience. We're all material scientists interested in various rock types. But uh, first, we have to consider um, the questions that we're asking. And the questions that we're asking really does set the scale for the entire study. Uh, so we have to look at humans and human behavior. How uh, are we framing our research to address those human behavior questions. Uh, that is important. What are we asking? Uh, we are all rock-minded individuals, but uh, to really start with these type of projects, we have to look at how prehistoric people are using that material. And uh, in the past, and uh, even today, uh, currently, uh, we are uh, addressing those human behavioral questions by looking at our materials uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, first, um, this uh, method is still very popular and kind of laid the, the groundwork for our research. It's visual analysis of the materials, describing uh, the rock materials in terms of color and luster, uh, texture, tractability. Uh, very important to do that first, and that's uh, where a lot of our research has been built upon. And then a number of us look at uh, petrography, creating thin sections from the materials and looking at the micro-mineral content or uh, the fossil inclusions to try to differentiate uh, one material type from the next. And finally, uh, geochemistry has, uh, has really taken off in the past a number of decades. Um, these techniques uh, allow us to uh, make those connections between the geologic environment at the time that the material was deposited and formed and uh, try to separate out uh, that, that variation within them. So these methods are great and uh, all of us kind of know that uh, kind of uh, the best approach to doing what we're doing is a combination of different techniques. Um, but there's a lot of considerations we uh, have to uh, think about uh, before uh, embarking in, in this type of research program. And the first of that is the scale. By scale, I mean the size uh, of our project. Uh, and really what dictates, there's a number of things that dictate the size of our projects. But first, it's that question that we're asking the data set. What are we interested in? What type of human behavior question are we asking? That'll set the scale, and that'll help us determine the number of samples we need and the size in our surveys or our size of our type collection database that we need to address uh, that question. Then, of course, uh, another thing uh, that really drives our research forward is the geologic distribution and the geographic distribution of those raw materials. and that in turn will uh, help us set the scale uh, for the study. And of course, uh, we love this one, this next one here, variation. How much variation is in our material types? 
hopefully that variation is patterned in a way that will allow us to separate out one source from the next. And the ability to characterize and separate out the variation between material types will further refine the scale of our sourcing uh, projects. And oftentimes we have to uh, quantify variation using st statistical treatments of that. Uh, but we, really what kind of drives my mindset and, and influences my research is how these materials formed. Uh, so a lot of us have some strong geologic background, myself not necessarily included in that community. Uh, however, uh, this is what's interesting. Uh, these materials uh, formed in different microenvironments, and because of things that affected the diagenesis, of our charts or flints, uh, that imparts a certain degree of variation or variability within the material. Uh, so the more that we can structure our research to not only quantify variation in the rock, but link that variation with the uh, paleo-depositional environment, uh, with the formation of those materials, the better we're off. So this is what's uh, really driving this research forward. It's interesting. Uh, so uh, most of us in this room do not need an introduction to uh, the chocolate flint. Uh, however, uh, I, I did. <laughs> so uh, looking at this material and looking at uh, the previous work that's been done, it's, it's quite amazing. A, a really good example of in-depth surveys, uh, even up to this day where uh, these uh, evidence of prehistoric or Stone Age mining is well documented. Uh, the geology we still struggle with uh, because ma many of those uh, carbonate formations have dissolved away. So there's still a question as to separating out Jurassic uh, formations in time and space. Uh, but uh, the surveys are ongoing. So it's extremely interesting. Great material type. So uh, what can we uh, learn about the past from a source study of chocolate flint? And there's a lot of different things here, a lot of different human behavior questions. We can ask a data set that would accurately be able to source material types. We can start talking about mobility, uh, territory range of different Stone Age groups. We can look at community structure, how they're using resource, their social networks, how they're exchanging material between different groups over uh, large areas uh, of Eastern Europe here. And all this kind of relies on an accurate ability to source the artifacts back to uh, the deposit. Now if we're looking at uh, wide range uh, mobility in the Mesolithic time period, uh, maybe it's enough just to say that, yes, this in fact is Upper Jurassic chocolate flint uh, from this region of the Holy Cross mountain range, and, and that would be fine. But what really interests me is uh, refined spatial data, refined source data, in which taking artifacts and sourcing them back to specific outcrops, <laughs> and then talking about is there some type of um, uh, control or uh, use of the quarry through time uh, with different groups. Uh, this is the type of uh, questions that demand uh, that we develop techniques to be able to more accurately source artifacts back to specific deposits and maybe even specific regions within the deposit. And as we all know in here, Flint has so much variation, it's extremely difficult to do that. Uh, but yet we keep trying. So, so this, why is there variation within flint? You know, why, why do we have uh, the potential ability to source artifacts back to different deposits? Again, related to the depositional environment. And we, when we think what um, this landscape looked like during the Upper Jurassic period, it's completely different. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things happening in the sedimentary environment that are adding variation, and that are out. There's clastic materials coming in here, shallow sea environments, uh, <coughs> lagoons, swamps. Uh, so this paleo-depositional environment is interesting 
because it, it's 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 the flint is beginning to form here. The, the silica is being laid down, but it imparts that uh, possibly a fingerprint of unique geologic variation that uh, potentially it, uh, might allow us to source artifacts back to uh, small spots on the landscape because of that depositional environment. So the techniques that I'm using and I'm trying to develop is, is broadly called reflectance spectroscopy. It's not, uh, the data type is different from uh, a lot of things that we have read or published ourselves. It's the data that it gives us isn't necessarily mineral content. It's not necessarily quantifying the geochemistry uh, of the rock type. What it is, is it's looking at the atomic and molecular composition of the flint in this case. The dipole bonded molecules within flint and the structure of the silica matrix within the flint. Um, each piece or each deposit potentially has a unique uh, composition uh, of different uh, impurities like clay minerals and iron oxides and hydroxyl bonding within that <coughs> silica matrix. And if we could quantify that and its pattern variation, then, then we're, we're in business, we're good to go. So the data is different, and uh, this is just an insert of one of the spreadsheets of data uh, here. Um, that is recorded per wavelength uh, from the visible part of the spectrum through the near infrared and into the middle infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And when uh, a molecule or uh, an atom is bombarded by uh, specific wavelength, it could potentially react. It bumps up into a higher energy state. And with that jump in energy state, it creates an absorption feature as it's absorbing that specific radiation at that specific band. So therefore, uh, these techniques will give you uh, thousands of raw reflectance numbers across those portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And depending on how and what impurities are in the silica and how they're arranged, uh, potentially it's giving you a diagnostic signature of it. So it's not geochemical data per se, and it's not mineral data per se. It's reflectance data across a range of spectra. Now you could process this to get you s some some quantities, uh, amounts of minerals or geochemistry, but it's not, uh, it's not those data sets that we're used to seeing. So, uh, Dakmar was kind enough to send me uh, over 40 samples of chocolate flint, flint and uh, Jurassic uh, Krakow uh, material for comparison. And what we wanted to do was test the reflecting spectroscopy technique uh, it t tests its, uh, its ability to separate out uh, the Jurassic Krakow flint samples from the lookalike chocolate flint samples. So she sent me uh, three uh, groups of samples uh, of chocolate flint, and then she sent me a group of over 10 samples of the Jurassic Krakow uh, materials. Uh, the Perspica, the Zelli, uh, the Polanyi 2 materials, and the Ornosco. Uh, I apologize for my pronunciation of those uh, samples. Uh, but through this, we wanted we could ask the, the technique uh, a couple different questions. First off, can we separate the, out the Upper Jurassic Krakow materials from the, uh, the chocolate flint, and then we can ask the data set another question. Can we separate out individual deposits within those uh, material types? So this is an image right here of the technique I have at the University of Memphis currently. It uh, records data in the middle uh, infrared range. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to collect reflectance spectroscopy in the visible or near infrared portions due to uh, the instrument kind of acting up on me uh, that particular day of analysis. So I'm just going to present the middle infrared uh, data set and uh, leave it at that. Uh, so here graphically is what all those thousands of reflectance uh, numbers look like. 
uh, portrayed. This is a pretty typical, this is uh, one analysis on one geologic sample of chocolate flint. This is a very typical reflectance image of silica in the middle IR range from about 2,500 nanometers all the way up to 25,000 nanometers. And the spectrum is dominated by this Rostralin bands, uh, the SiO-Si bonding of silica. Since flint or other material types are 90 to 99% silica, this is what dominates the spectrum. So I'm sitting in the lab and analyzing hundreds of samples at a time, and I'm thinking, man, I'd really like to see something different pop up on the computer screen. Uh, but this is basically all I see uh, during my hours of analysis here. And uh, at first glance, you're like, well, if all the spectrum looked like this, there's very little chance of differentiating it. But what I found is, I was kind of zooming in on some of the shorter wavelength regions. That's where the difference is at. There's subtle changes in slope. So whereas these large features are telling me, oh, that's silica, uh, smaller features are saying that's you know, calcium carbonate or dolomite, some other type of carbonate feature here. Uh, but even zooming in, there's smaller peaks and valleys that are related to other things going on, iron oxides and such. And it's also important to note that subtle slope changes within the, the, these features is also extremely important too. So very, very hard to visually pluck out differences in the spectrum unlike uh, possibly analyzing obsidian with an XRF device. Uh, very, uh, very uh, just about impossible picking out differences visually. When you're analyzing hundreds of samples, uh, <coughs> your human eye and your human brain is great about picking out patterns, but when you're looking at hundreds of samples stacked on top of the, each other, it's, it's very difficult. So we have to use some statistics. I also process the spectra using a couple different techniques uh, that, are, that are widely known and published uh, in order to standardize the results. I uh, perform a normalization function that minimizes intensity differences of the spectra. I uh, smooth out the spectrum using a first derivative transform, which also highlights the smaller absorption features. Uh, so these uh, five spectra here are um, processed, so they went from uh, this being just one, so here's R5 here from the uh, sample locations. Uh, these are averages of all, all of the samples from each deposit. And I vertically offset them on this scale so that you can see them a little bit better. And even after processing them and cleaning up the data a little bit, you still see how similar it is, how similar the spectra is. Um, I added a control right here. This is a group of materials uh, from, uh, from Tennessee. This is actually chur. But here's our flint, the first, the top four, and then this is chur from Tennessee. All very, very similar. But if you looked at uh, some of the little peaks and valleys, there's small little differences. Again, uh, very difficult to pick out uh, one feature in particular and say, oh, well, with this uh, the zeolite material, you're always going to have this. Uh, that's that's uh, almost impossible to do. So what we're interested in, and what all of us are interested in, is really characterizing variation, uh, pattern variation within our deposits. Not necessarily plucking out, oh, there's higher iron content in this compared to the calcium content, but looking at the range of calcium, looking at the range of iron, within 30, 40, 50, 100 samples from each deposit. That is uh, where it's really going to refine our work here. So I take all those hundreds of reflectance spectroscopy values, of reflecting spectra, and I can't visually pluck out the differences. So then I'm relying on a statistical technique that looks at each and every reflectance value in compares it within the sample database to see if it's diagnostic for that particular flint type. Uh, so the technique I'm using is discriminant function analysis, uh, which does that very nicely. Um, these are some uh, scatter plots from uh, my research, my database uh, that I have in my lab. Uh, 
there's over 2,000 samples of chert. There are different formations. And then they, these are uh, groupings or different deposits of chert within one formation. So by using discriminant function analysis, it's looking at, it's weighting, uh, comparing each value out of hundreds of reflect reflectance values to see if uh, the, that particular one is diagnostic for a particular uh, material type. So let's get to the preliminary results from this study. Uh, these cluster over here is chocolate flint, flint uh, from here. And uh, all the other ones off to the right hand side there are uh, materials of chart from my own database. Because the first question I wanted to ask the data was, OK, if all the spectra look very much the same and it's all pretty much silica, let's see if we can, step one, differentiate out chocolate flint from Poland from all these chert materials in my own data set back in the United States. And uh, yes, great results, uh, no overlap there. Okay, step one, we're, we're okay. So if we analyze an artifact, a blade, a prismatic blade from, from Eastern Europe, it's not gonna uh, you know, uh, return uh, a source value from Tennessee. That'd be truly amazing. Uh, we could write lots of textbooks about that, changing prehistory, but uh, no, uh, fortunately that will not happen. So the next question is, okay, we know we have one sample group, uh, over 10 samples of the Jurassic Krakow material, uh, shown here in green, and uh, let's just see, they look alike materials uh, at times, so let's just see if that can separate out from the, the chocolate flint deposits analyzed. And uh, the orange right here is just a control. You always have to have a control here. So again, this is uh, some Ford paint chart from, from Tennessee I just threw in there. Uh, but the, the most important thing to look at is, wow, okay, great. We can potentially differentiate out those upper Jurassic uh, crack out materials from the chocolate flint uh, below. So great. And Based on what we know, or what we think we know about the geology of how these materials formed, we would think that there should be enough variation uh, to, to show that. So really, the, the final question is, OK, now this is, this is the great thing. Let's see if we can uh, differentiate out these individual deposits within the same formation. And of course, I've, I've left the SAS of uh, materials in there, but uh, these uh, three separate sample groups of uh, chocolate flint separate out very nicely. Again, this is a smaller sample size. We're talking uh, 10 to 13 samples per deposit. Um, this is step one now. Um, so possibly someday uh, we can use similar techniques or a range of different techniques to uh, not only source materials back to the chocolate flint uh, formation, but also to individual deposits within that formation. And that's, a, that's, a, that's really exciting for us. Okay. So um, for just discussion purposes, I mean, these preliminary results uh, show the potential of reflecting spectroscopy of doing this. However, it's preliminary. The sample sizes are small. Uh, but future research, we really need to, to quantify it. We really need to know, okay, if there is variation between the individual deposits, what is that variation related to? It's kind of a backwards approach, uh, but it's, it's necessary. So um, we really need to get back into the raw data itself and look at the most diagnostic regions. What uh, reflectance uh, value wavelengths are being pulled out for the discriminant function and what do they mean in terms of geochemistry in terms of micro mineral content how why is there enough variation here to separate out one from the other and a lot of this work has already done been done by myself and uh, my colleagues uh, uh, looking at different chert types in North America looking at these spectral we call them spectral windows these diagnostic windows uh, with with uh, some really neat attributes. And so we're looking at iron oxide bonding. Um, clay minerals really excites my geology colleagues in the department. Uh, when I start talking about clay minerals, they get all excited because 
clay minerals are very diagnostic and relate to that paleo depositional environment of formation. Uh, so I need to collaborate a lot more with uh, those type of individuals to really see, okay, yes, there is variation. Yes, we can, it looks like we can characterize that variation and differentiate it out. But what does that variation really mean? Uh, also, this uh, technique's non-destructive. Uh, however, uh, I really need to do more controlled experiments on the, the outer weathered surface of artifacts. Uh, how does that patina formation process uh, affect the results? Um, does it negatively affect the results? Does it positively affect the results? How is the mechanical weathering of the surfaces of our artifacts who have been in the ground for thousands of years potentially uh, affect these results? Now, the reflectance spectroscopy technique isn't purely analyzing just the surface of the artifact alone. It's penetrating to a couple millimeters in depth. So, and then diffusely scattering uh, those results. So it's not purely superficial, but if we want to keep this technique non-destructive, uh, we really need to, I really need to, and with the help of you, we really need to uh, quantify the weathering of our artifacts and see what happens there. So I've, I've already conducted some small little preliminary studies, but I need a full-blown, uh, much larger study to publish. Uh, and also, uh, I just received word of funding to get a couple new instruments, which is always fun. Uh, we'll be getting uh, two portable instruments that will allow me to uh, take those instruments on the road with me and to analyze collections in museums and, and private uh, collections as well. So I'm really hoping uh, the, those new portable instruments also have a finer spectral resolution than the older ones I'm using now. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll get to pick up some more uh, diagnostic reflectance values with that. And of course, sampling. Uh, again, for this study, uh, we only looked at um, 10 to 13 samples per deposit. And really, that's not enough, um, I'm finding. Uh, 30 should be a minimum. Uh, with variation in Flint, it's really in the hundreds to quantify that variation, but I'll be satisfied with, with 40, 30 to 40 uh, for now. And then maybe my predecessors or many of you can add more and more to the database. But And we've known that from our geochemical analysis techniques too. One, two samples, maybe even 10 samples just isn't enough. But we've been handicapped because of cost before. It's so expensive and it's time consuming and it's potentially destructive uh, to analyze all these samples. Uh, but again, what I'm finding is we need a large sample set to really characterize and quantify uh, the variation per deposit. And potentially with more samples, the refiner, the finer our spatial resolution will be in our studies. Not just talking about sourcing artifacts to a formation, but talking about sourcing artifacts back to a specific deposit and possibly even a small sector within that deposit or quarry site would be really interesting. Thinking about those, um, those mesolithic galleries, those, uh, those individual mines, sourcing artifacts back to individual mines. Um, now I've lost you, I know that's, that's a ridiculous uh, dream of, of mine, but possibly someday with more refined sampling we might be able to ask and answer those types of questions. So uh, I'm very optimistic. Um, when I studied, uh, when I started looking at Chert and Flint, uh, my um, obsidian source colleagues were like, you're ridiculous, there's way too much variation in Chert, there's way too much variation in Flint, and it doesn't seem patterned, the geochemistry does not seem patterned. But uh, look at our, uh, look at Catalina's research, and uh, look at this research, there's, Related to the time of deposition, I believe that there's enough variation that we can quantify that and one day source artifacts back to individual deposits or sectors within a single deposit. So, very interesting. But I want to uh, thank the Institute for inviting me here. Uh, this has been great. I'm, I'm very much enjoying this conference. And so thank you very much for uh, sending me an excellent Christmas gift this past year, and those, uh, those Flint samples, I appreciate it. Thank you.